Beatrice and Joachim, thank you very much for inviting me to this nice meeting here. I'm surprised how many people are joining this conference. I, I wasn't prepared. There's so many people who will be here. A great moment. Thank you. So I would like to talk about eight points that I would like to make. And in my summary, I come back to these eight points. So first of all, there's good news. As we know, I, I love to see Scandinavian data for very good reasons. They have the best registries in terms of cancer incidence measurement and follow-up. So here's an analysis over four decades. What we can see in terms of re estimated relative survival it has enormously increased, spoken across all cancers overall. So there's really good news. And some cancers have an extraordinary high survival nowadays, like testicular cancer, for example. So there's clearly good news, but still there's also bad news in Scandinavia. And again, I come back to Scandinavia, and this is very similar in other European countries, but these are our high resolution data from Scandinavia. Again, I talk about the overall incidence of invasive cancer. And as you can see here, we have a considerable increase over four decades or five decades, not only due to ideology, maybe also some better detection, some changes of classifications, of course, but I believe the driving force here is ideology. So that brings me back to my uh, standard talk here. If you see um, those incidence changes over five decades, enormous changes, would we really believe that this is caused by genetic shift or drift. From all we know in terms of genetic shift or drift, this is an unlikely explanation to explain such an incidence increase over time. So it must be something else than genetic changes in populations. Most likely it's non-genetic. I checked the web page of Clara as I wasn't aware about Clara before I was invited. So here's a nice mission statement. Um, which I simply typed down here on the slide. Its goal is twofold, rapid transfer of discoveries to patients and commercial application of research. So rapid transfer has implication in terms of what should we study in epidemiology or what is more mechanistically driven but won't produce rapid transfer most likely. So the implication of that statement on rapid transfer um, will be developed here. So Maybe you know this terminology, ivory tower. You're sitting in a little tower in your little own world. You dream of very fancy things, but they might have no impact at population level. And we can also do, and we do that very much, we do ivory tower epidemiology and also cancer epidemiology. We must admit. So what is this? Epidemi epidemiology of factors that do not or only barely provide a potential for interventions or actions or that are associated with a low population attributable risk. So let me see some examples. We like to study race, the effect of race. But it's not race, it's racism whatsoever, but it's not race itself. There is even an extreme view. We should only study factors that can be manipulated. Otherwise, it's not causation at all. But this is an extreme view that is not shared by many people. And the consequences of the rapid transfer thing in Clara should be we should study as epidemiologists public health relevant factors that would play a role in terms of transfer. So that should be factors where we can intervene on, first of all, and factors that produce higher population attributable risks. And what that actually is will be developed later by myself. This is a very little formula only to illustrate what is population attributable risk. My second point, principles of translational cancer epidemiology and obstacles. Here's a nice paper by Curie and colleagues. He, he makes a distinction between five phases. The very first phase called T0, it's a kind of hypothesis generation phase. In epidemiology, frequently done by high resolution descriptive studies of the incidence of cancers. Not very popular anymore, because people dream of more fancy studies. However, we need T0 studies in translational epidemiology. The second phase is risk factor characteristics that are studied. Third phase, studies on risk factor interventions. You see manipulation comes up, action comes up. Fourth, implementation science. Once we know how to intervene on a factor, how can we implement that intervention at population level to decrease the burden of cancer? 
And finally, effect evaluation at population level. These are the five phases that Curie and colleagues um, suggested once we think about translational epidemiology. Here's an example of a tier zero, a new example, which produces much discussion among testicular cancer researchers. Um, you see, first of all, cancer incidence rates up to 2000, I think, 12. And thereafter, they used APC modeling to forecast the ongoing tr trends in the future. You, you might even not observe the confidence intervals. They are very small. Is this point on here? I'm not sure. You see, you see the little bands around the, the dots? These are confidence intervals. So this is highly precisely estimated. So what we see is an astonishing finding among Hispanics in the United States in terms of testicular cancer risk. And this, has been, this astonishing finding has been produced by T0 studies in the translational epidemiolog epidemiology field, that is, running good descriptive incidence studies on cancer. We need those studies more and more, especially due to questions that, are, that come up due to omics research. I believe we even more need those studies in the future. However, there are several obstacles that I suffer myself from, by the way. When we have those meetings, interdisciplinary meetings, we frequently don't understand each other anymore. We use the same terms, mean different concepts, or we, we use different words, but mean the same concept. Both things happen. Or we are not interested in each other's fields, although in terms of translation, all these fields should be under one umbrella. And of course, there are some hypes for some umbrellas and underestimates or underestimations for other umbrellas which makes it difficult to really do translational or also transdisciplinary research in terms of etiology of, testicle, uh, of cancer, not only testicle. My third point, big data. When we go back, there are nice statements to find. In the 70s, it stated about that period of time, we had many good theories, but too little data to, to empirically study those theories. 2014, a statement by IBM, if you check big data on the webpage of IBM, we produce every day 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. Chris Anderson, 2008, states, the sheer volume of data makes theories and scientific methods needless. Just let the data speak. Do you remember Tuke in the 60s? He also suggested, let the data speak. That didn't work in the end. But here's the next wave of let the data speak with more intelligent things like neural networking, etc. Et However, Nate Silver made a very good point in his book, The Signal and the Noise. The increase of information can worsen the signal to noise ratio if the increase of noise is larger than the increase of signals. So we get so many noises, maybe, that it will become harder to detect signals. This is a pessimistic view by Nate Silver. I'm not as pessimistic, but we have to be careful with the many noises or signals that come up now. There is even this idea of GVAS, Genome Wide Association Studies. We can do that, those research things without any hypothesis. Isn't it great? No hypotheses are needed anymore. Let the data speak. I think this is not modern epidemiology. That might deserve another name, because I give you an idea about our reference book of modern epidemiology. If you check the first 21 chapters, they are on the methods in our field. Thereafter, you see substantive chapters like cancer epi, cardiovascular epi, etc. But the methods chapters, 21 in this book, you can summarize it. If you think that methods are not important, at least 50% of these chapters can now be ignored. Simply be ignored. Is that really true? I said those approaches agnostic approaches, as Paolo just said, it's agnostic. These approaches, if we do that with epidemiology, it might deserve a different name. It's, maybe it's not epidemiology, it's something else. And Louis Scala recently published a paper in the European Journal of Epi. He calls it population biology, because the typical features of epidemiology are not included in those GIVA studies anymore. Signal versus noise, here's a little counting which I did in PubMed, I checked the number of entrances per year. So on the x-axis you, you see the calendar years, on the y-axis entrances per year, and there is an enormous exponential increase of publications in PubMed. Uh, until 2013 these were 20 million entrances. In 1973 we had 
only 230,000 entrances. In 2013, it's 1.2 million entrances per year. That produces problems. 75 trials and 11 systematic reviews per day are included into PubMed. Who will keep up, keep up with the literature? Very hard to do. However, to come up with excellent, well-founded hypotheses, we have to synthesize the available evidence across fields to find out what is known, what is unknown. Fourth, pretest probabilities of etiologic hypotheses. I do a very simple thing here. Let's think in terms of studies with a 80% statistical power, 1 minus beta equals 80%, Alpha 0.05, type 1 error, fixed, two-sided testing. We would have 1,000 hypotheses that we can raise as scientists. And let's imagine 5% would be true. God would tell us these 5% are true. So let's see what the significance testing field would produce us. 50 true non-null hypotheses, 950 true null hypotheses. Null means no effect, nil hypothesis also called. So now we do the testing thing. Among the 50 true non-null hypothesis, hypothesis, 40 will be detected as statistically significant. However, among the 950 true null hypothesis, again 48 will be detected as statistically significant due to type 1 error that produces us a positive predictive value of 45%. So if God would tell us 5% of hypotheses that are raised are true, and we use significance testing with that scenario, only 45% of significant findings will be true. 55% the majority will be wrong, wrong signals. Now let's increase the pretest probability of hypothesis. Let's imagine we would have a to find a way to, to find out better well-founded hypotheses. What does it produce? Here I assume 50% of 1,000 hypotheses would be true. So what does that produce? That produces a pro positive predictive value of 94%. So what does it tell us if you do significance testing? We have to increase the pretest probability of the truth of hypothesis. And I try to show you later on what can we do to increase these pretest hypotheses. Also, it tells us we should maybe refrain from significance testing at all. We should set up a meta analytic view on data. Coming up with well founded hypotheses for cancer etiology, also for other fields. What is a well founded hypothesis? A hypothesis with a reasonably high pretest probability of truth. That's my definition, my subjective de definition. How can we come up with those hypotheses? We have to do the hard job to go through the literature. We, need, we have to continue to do this. My doctoral students don't like that anymore. Oh, the many readings, 300 papers. Not only epi papers, we as epidemiologists also have to read more basic research papers, most likely. Omics papers, etc. And we have to have an interdisciplinary exchange of beliefs. I give you an example of what we did. This was a kind of experiment. Every four years, there's a world famous conference in Copenhagen on testicular cancer. And very famous testicular cancer researchers are present. I give you a few names Niels Kekebeck, Osa Huslo, Jenga, McLinn. They are all present. And because of its a kind of meagerness or draft of new etiologic hypotheses in the field of cancer epi, testicular cancer epi, we set up a survey. The first phase was this famous experts in a questionnaire-based survey, please give us suggestions of etiologic hypotheses that you believe are plausible. The second phase at the end of the conference, they were asked to do a rating on a scale of 1 up to 10. One completely implausible, ten highly plausible. And then you can find what came up that has been published. I don't go through all the hypotheses, but just to give you a, a rough idea, on the left upper panel, you see a forest plot, and these are exposures related to pregnancy, typically nutritional factors during pregnancy. And there you see some exposures that are, 
that have a high plausibility across fields. Basic researchers, pathologists, epidemiologists, clinicians. They produce overall a high rating of those hypotheses, like fat consumption during pregnancy, insulin concentration during pregnancy, and other factors. On the right upper panel, you see some other exposures of interest, also, which is hotly debated, endocrine disrupting agents that has a very high plausibility across fields, obviously, and so on. So after that literature review, we did the second phase to increase the pretest probability of truth of hypothesis by interdisciplinary discussions among experts. Point six, ecologic studies. When I learned epidemiology in Boston, I was taught, well, ecologic studies, remember, ecologic fallacy, they are prone to bias. Yes, it's a paradigm in the textbooks nowadays. Be careful with ecologic studies. However, I believe times have really changed in terms of several factors and there should be a revival for ecologic studies, which I will show you soon. So what is an ecological study, first of all? You do have from populations mean exposures or proportions of exposures. You do have rates of outcomes, but only on an aggregate level, not on an individual level. Like we would know from France the incidence rate of lung cancer among men, and we would know the prevalence of smoking in France. So these are two aggregated variables. We can assess those variables across countries or within countries, across regions in a country. So here's a famous one, Armstrong and Doll, where they found something that has been replicated, confirmed, and remember, as Paolo also said, 2016, the recommendation by IAC, per 50 gram of meat consumption, you remember this. So why is that interesting still to do, despite some potential biases? Remember, all style. All studies have potential biases. Why is it still attractive to do it? Let's do a thought experiment. There is one population that has no exposure to factor A. Let's say no exposure to endocrine disrupting agents. There's another population that has a uniform exposure to endocrine disrupting agents. And now we would go to population one and would do an individual case control or case cohort or cohort study we couldn't find any association between endocrine disrupting agents and the outcome of interest. The same would happen if you do a separate study among individuals in population two. Why? Because both populations have no variation in terms of exposure. That's a problem. So if we have uniform distributions of exposures in population, populations, individual epidemiological studies won't detect associations, but ecologic studies can detect associations. So what, what should a modern ecologic study on cancer epi look like? First of all, you are in the paradise, like IAC has all the data. So we do have overall, currently in volume 10, 424 cancer registry files. And the vast majority have been quality checked and have high quality from the several regions within countries and across countries. So nowadays we have very good data at hand. Second thing, as compared to previous ecologic studies, we have to think in terms of causation. So there is some induction and latency period until exposures can transfer their effect on outcomes. So nowadays, a modern ecologic study should use survey data from maybe 10, 15 years ago. And nicely, I checked only some of them, we now do have, if we go back the recent 15, 20 years, we do have nice survey data from many populations. Even if we don't have survey data, we do have consumption data, economical consumption data across populations. So I believe, given the high quality incidence data from registries nowadays, given that we now have more and more survey data from these populations, even 10, 15 years ago, it's time for a revival of ecologic studies. There are also statistical approaches to find out which tumors should be hot candidates. So we did this with intra-class correlation coefficients where we compared variations within countries with variations between countries. For example, stomach cancer among men, what we find out is we have a considerably higher variation between countries than within countries. This is an indication that ecologic studies on stomach cancer would make sense to do. So with this, with this statistic approach of ICCs, we can find out which tumors would be more appropriate or hot candidates for running ecologic studies. 
Seven, prioritization principles of etiological research. So I, I switch over to precision medicine. Tomorrow we have several se sessions on precision medicine. I call it stratified medicine. It's not precision, it's stratification. And you find often with important prognostic and treatment implications. So what does that mean for epidemiologists? Often with important etiologic and preventive implications. That's our approach in epidemiology. What does it mean if we say important? Completely unclear. What is important? Is it money? Potential years of life lost? So let's find a way. The human genome epidemiology people, they found a way to declare what is important. And here I mark the very last row of the table. And this says it sh the, the exposure should have a high potential population attributable risk on the basis of at least two studies. So what does that mean? Here's a repetition for you. What is a population attributable risk? The relative risk reduction incidence that would be achieved if the population had been entirely unexposed compared with its current actual exposure pattern. There's a very simple formula. As you can easily notice, the relative risk plays a role associated with the exposure of interest and the relative frequency of the exposure in the population. These two factors trigger population attributable risk. I give you two examples. Let's assume a genetic factor has a relative frequency of 5% in the population, and it would have a relative risk of 1.2 or of 2.0. And now do, and we do the thought experiment, we could remove that effect of the genetic marker. We would have action or intervention to do that. What does that mean? For a genetic marker with a relative risk of 1.2, we expect that one per mil, one per thousand of the cancers, the current cancers would be reduced. 0.1%, 1, 0 .1%, one per mil. If the relative risk becomes larger, 2.0, roughly 5% of the incidence cases could be prevented by that intervention. So the human genome epidemiologists, in terms of rapid transfer, action at population level, give us indications what we should do we should estimate the population attributable risk and then set up a priority list of factors that should be studied further in terms of potential interventions. My last point, subtyping of cancers. Here I'm very enthusiastic, to be honest. Um, first of all, this is a very simple statement. Subtyping of cancers reduces etiologic misclassification if subtypes differ etiologically. So, if small cell lung cancer would have a different etiology than adenocarcinoma of the lung, we shouldn't combine these two entities into one group and model the association between exposures and outcome. We should separate these groups clearly. clearly. A very simple thought. Otherwise, otherwise, we produce misclassification, causal misclassification. How can we do some subtyping. We can do it by histology. Example, testicular cancer, very popular. Also lung cancer, breast cancer. We can do it by molecular markers. Very popular, luminal A, B, triple negative, etc. We can also do it by dignity. Think in terms of breast lesions, how complicated this has become in terms of pathology. Non-proliferative non lesions, proliferative lesions without a to -pia. Those with atopia, lobular carcinoma in situ, you see all the, the gradual, more and more serious changes at cellular level. And we also know already epidemiologically, if you compare the graphs, the cumulative in incidences with the no prior biopsy group, you see as more and more atopi atopia comes up or proliferation comes up, the higher the risk of invasive breast cancer in the end. So I believe. Stratification, either by histology, molecular things, or by dignity, makes sense to do, and we do have those data nowadays at hand. They come up in routine clinical pathways when, when, when we take care of patients. So here's an example of what I tried with testicular cancer. Lumping or splitting, I, I argued the descriptive epidemiology of this tumor indicates that etiology differs by histology. There are many more factors. I gave you only four. There are many more factors available. So what did we do? We did a systematic review of the literature. There were overall 150 etiologic studies on testicular cancer. 
that provided separate estimates for seminoma and for non-seminoma testicular cancer. And then we could study how does the ratio of relative risk behave. So we have a relative risk estimate, let's say for a simple factor, cryptorchidism, and the risk of seminoma, that would be 4.2 in that one study, and the association between cryptorchidism and non-seminoma, that would be 3.55, so the ratio of these two relative risks would be 1.19. If ideology is identical, that ratio should become 1. Same relative risk for seminoma as well as for non-seminoma. So we identified over our 1,148 ratios of relative risks, and we plotted the distribution. We were surprised. It's according to our null hypothesis view. It looks like only random fluctuation here. What we also did is, We plotted these ratios of relative risk by precision. As high as the CLR value, that's the confidence limit ratio, the in inverse of the confidence limit ratio. It's a measure of precision. As higher the measure of precision, as close as the ratio to one. So the very imprecise cancer epistasis provided highly interesting differences in terms of etiology between seminoma and non-seminoma. We were really surprised. However, as we now notice, it has to do with random fluctuation. What we also did is, we stratified by exposure fields of interest. Again, we always saw the same plots. That has to do with studies that are, have not been powered for running separate analysis by histologic subtype. These studies are heavily underpowered. Therefore, it's not, in the end, a true null result. There is uncertainty. It might have to do with low power for separating relative risk estimates related to seminoma versus non-seminoma. So descriptive epidemiology gives us strong indications that these tumors differ in terms of etiology. Until now, analytical epidemiology does not. So I come to my summary. I don't read these points again. Just for discussion, for your orientation, I give you my major points again. Thank you very much for listening to me. Hopefully it was not too technically or too statistically driven. Thank you.